Good evening and welcome to 3GNY Stories Live. We do Wednesdays. I'm David Wax, president of 3GNY and grandchild of two Holocaust survivors. I'm thrilled to be here for our sixth We Do Wednesday featuring Elise Wolf. We're glad to have many new viewers on tonight, as many as well as many of our valued community members who regularly participate in our programs. Thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate that you're here. Before we dive into tonight's program, I want to wish you all a Shana Tova. We know this is a particularly challenging moment in time, and we hope the new year is filled with sweetness and good health for you and your loved ones. 3GNY is an educational nonprofit for grandchildren of, of, of survivors and our supporters. As a living link, we preserve the legacies and the lessons of the Holocaust. Our mission is to educate diverse communities about the perils of intolerance and to provide a supportive forum for the descendants of survivors. Founded in 2005 with a group of six, 3GNY's membership now exceeds 3,200 members. Before COVID-19, we've held a wide variety of in-person programs, and now we're hosting virtual events to keep our community connected. 3GNY has also played a leading role in launching other 3G groups, including 3GDC and 3GNJ, which you'll hear more about shortly. 3GNY is most proud of our flagship educational program, We Do, which is short for We Educate. This initiative empowers grandchildren of survivors to learn and compellingly share their family's Holocaust experiences in school classrooms and with community groups. We Do was developed under the guidance of Facing History and Ourselves, and it prepares participants to learn and teach their family stories. We Do is a powerful contribution to Holocaust education. As the population of survivors declines, their stories should not be lost with them. As a living link to our grandparents' stories, we are in a special position to elevate the individual experience from the collective. We create a personal connection to history. The Holocaust serves as an in instructive entry point for examining prejudice today. Our speakers make connections between historical events and intolerance and encourage students to think about ways to confront these issues in their own lives. For we do, we have a collaborative partnership with the American Society for Yad Vashem's Young Leadership Associates Group. We are thankful for their support. Since we do started in 2010, we've trained more than 250 speakers, visited 270 classrooms in nearly 100 different schools, and have reached more than 25,000 students. We are deeply committed to keeping this important work going. Since COVID-19 hit, we've moved our We Do training sessions for 3Gs onto a virtual platform. We're now visiting classrooms via Zoom and working with teachers to ensure we can still make an impact, even if we cannot go to classrooms in person right now. We have so much more to do. It is our responsibility to keep these stories alive and to educate as many people as possible. In order for us to keep training 3Gs like Elise, your support is essential. 3GNY is a volunteer-run organization and relies on donations to keep We Do and many other programs going. A gift of any amount will help sustain We Do and train even more 3Gs to become powerful speakers. There is a link to make a donation in the chat box, and we hope you'll consider making one. Thank you for helping us honor our grandparents' stories and for ensuring that never forget is more than just an empty phrase. At this time, I'd like to introduce Jessica Wang, co-founder of 3GNJ, who will share more details and introduce Elise. Thanks so much, David. <clears throat> so I met Elise a few years ago when Nancy Gorell, who I know is on this evening, welcome Nancy and good to have you here, the curator, curator of the Shimon and Sarah Birnbaum JCC Holocaust Memorial and Education Center in Bridgewater, New Jersey introduced us. This wasn't a casual introduction. As the collector of data on New Jersey-based Holocaust survivors, Nancy identified us as the grandchildren of survivors who also share an, a mission to educate others on the perils of the Holocaust and lessons we can learn and teach others. Together with the third person, Michelle Edgar, Elise and I founded 3GNJ. We have benefited from the start from David Walks, a Bridgewater native, uh, thanks David, and 3GNY. David and other 3GNY board members schlepped from the New York City, Hoboken, and Jersey City areas 
to help us get 3G and J off the ground. As part of that effort, we launched a WeDo New Jersey education program in Bridgewater in spring of 2019 with 12 participants. Me, Elise, and several others crafted our grandparents' stories and have told these stories to school groups and other organizations. We are incredibly grateful. Now getting to Elise. Elise is the granddaughter of two Holocaust survivors. Her mother's father and mother both survived the war. Knowing that she is a descendant of survivors has greatly impacted Elise's life. In addition to continually studying the Holocaust, Elise has served as an appointed commissioner to the New Jersey State Commission on Holocaust Education since 2017. The commission's core mission is to promote Holocaust education in New Jersey and assist educators with various aspects of meeting the New Jersey state mandate to provide Holocaust and genocide education to all students. It, Elise, as I mentioned, is one of the three co-founders of 3GNJ. She holds a BS from the University of Maryland and a JD from Rutgers University for Law School. She is currently an assistant general counsel at Catalan Pharma Solutions in Somerset, New Jersey. Elise, Elise lives in Martinsville, New Jersey with her husband and two daughters. If questions come up, please type them into the Q&A and we will address them after the presentation. We will email a recording of this story tomorrow as well. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Elise Wolf. Thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you, David. And thank you all for attending today's program. Uh, I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen with you, which hopefully everybody will be able to see. Um, so as mentioned, I am the granddaughter of two survivors. Both my grandparents on my mother's side survived the war. And the reason I'm telling the story today is because as the last living link to my grandparent, uh, to my grandmother, it's important to me that she be remembered and that her story lives on well beyond her life. Unfortunately, we don't know very much about my grandfather's story because like many survivors, he did not share it. He passed away long before I was born, so I never had a chance to meet him or to learn about his experience. So today my focus will be on my grandmother's story, but of course my grandfather will play a role. When I think about my grandmother, I think about baking with her, dancing with her at my bat mitzvah, cooking with her, spending holidays with her, and also about the horrors that she endured. My grandmother's name was Yolan Moldovan Lichtman, but everybody called her Anyu, which means mother in Hungarian. She didn't speak often about her experience during the war, and she actually didn't really open up about it until I asked her about it. When I was young, I asked what the numbers were on her arm, and she told me that the bad people put, it, put the numbers there. And at the time, that was enough. But as I got older, I asked more questions, and for the first and only time, she spoke publicly to my eighth grade class when we were studying the Holocaust at my yeshiva. A lot of what I'm gonna tell you today is what she said to my class in 1994, in 1993, a year before she passed away. Unfortunately, due to um, technology at that time, I was unable to add some of her speak her clips of her speaking, but we're working on trying to get that um, cleaned up and hopefully I'll be able to share that at some point as well. My grandmother was born in Batiz, a small farming village in the Satumari region of Romania, which is on the border of, with Hungary. She was born on August 31st, 1918. Batiz was actually once part of Hungary, so my family spoke Hungarian, even though we were Romanian. And that's where the name Anyu comes from. My Anyu was the 10th of 11 children born to Hana and Vilma Moldovan. My middle name is Hana, named after my great grandmother. Because of the age difference between the first child and the youngest ch children, my grandmother actually had nieces and nephews who were closer in age to her than some of her own siblings. This next picture that I'm sharing with you is actually truly incredible to me because this was taken before my grandmother was born. The man in the middle is my grandmother's grandfather. On either side of him are my grandmother's parents. And then we see the first eight children. 
My grandmother's mother passed away when she was nine and she was raised by her father and her siblings. They lived in Batis, which was a farm country. They grew their own food, raised their own animals, took them to the butcher when they were ready to be eaten, and they didn't have indoor plumbing. My grandmother received nothing more than a third grade education. In 1940, uh, she met and became engaged to my grandfather, Joseph Lichtman. She was 16 when they met and he was 21 and they fell in love. It was love at first sight, but my grandmother, my grandfather's mother did not approve of my grandmother. She thought she came from too poor of a family. So although they got engaged in 1940, they did not marry until 1943. Another reason for the delay in the marriage was because my grandmother's older sisters had to be married first before she was allowed to marry. The war was already underway, but not yet in Satumare. As my grandmother said, she was one of the lucky ones because it wasn't until 1944 when the Germans invaded Satumare that she and my grandfather and their entire families were shipped to the Satumare ghetto. She explained how the Romanians were very quick to join in on the hatred for the Jews. She remembers hearing songs about them making fun of the Jewish people and killing them. She witnessed Jews being lined up and shot into a river. And even before they were forced into the ghetto, my grandmother told a story about her father, an elder member of the Jewish community, who was brought to a center square in the town and had his beard cut off by the German Nazis as a way to embarrass him. As my Anyu said, it was because he was Jewish. For no other reason did they do this. In the spring of 1944, the family was taken to the ghetto. Everybody on both sides of my, my family were taken there. She said that they were rushed out of their homes at gunpoint. And while some people were able to stop and pack some belongings to bring with them, she arrived to the ghetto with nothing but the clothes on her back. And she was there until 19, later in 1944, when the entire ghetto was um, de deported and sent to Auschwitz. She actually said she was one of the lucky ones because it, and she wasn't brought to the ghetto and to the camps until the war was nearing the end. This is a picture from history books with about the deportation from ghettos. And it all, it's very descriptive of the way my grandmother described it. The Satumari ghetto was liquidated through different transports from between May and June of 44. It's estimated that nine, almost 19,000 Jews were sent from that ghetto to Auschwitz. Anya described how 200 people were crammed into a cattle car. No food, no water, no bathroom. She said people were dying all around them, but they were so crammed in there that there was nowhere for the dead bodies to fall. She thinks they were on the train for about three to four days, which is a 300 mile train ride from Satumare to Auschwitz. It likely took longer than it should have because of the speed at which the train had to go. And in 1944, there could have already have been bombings and other instances causing the train to slow down. My grandmother was deported with one of her sisters, Irene, who she managed to stay with the entire time that, she was, that they were at Auschwitz. These are pictures showing the train tracks leading up to Auschwitz and also what is known as the welcome sign at Auschwitz, where it says, Arbeit mach frei work shall set you free. This, as we now know, was um, uh, made by Jewish people through forced labor, and the B was upside down, perhaps as a sign of resistance, or perhaps as a way to show that something wasn't right here. Anya spoke about the selection when they came off the train. She said there were guns everywhere. People were sent to the left, and people were sent to the right. One group, most of which were women and children, were sent to the shower. And we know there was no shower. They went straight to the gas chamber. As a newlywed, when my grandmother arrived at the camp, she was also newly pregnant, except she wasn't showing yet. She said, who we now think would have been Dr. Mangala, was there and asked for all of the pregnant women to step to the side. My grandmother said that she took a step and then a step back 
and decided that rather than leaving her sister, she would lie about her pregnancy. This is one of the many times she likely escaped death or worse. Anu also described how her arm was tattooed. Her number was A13143. And she talked about how every single needle prick hurt her so much. This number means that she was the 13,143rd prisoner in Auschwitz in the A series. That means there were so many thousands more both before and after her. Anya talked about how she was forced to get naked, that every hair on her body was shaved, and that all of the belongings she had, which was very little, were taken. This picture, I think, is a good example of the confusion and dread that these prisoners endured, not knowing how they ended up here, why they were here, or what would come next. I can only imagine how my Anu felt. She explained that she was first brought to a big barrack that had nothing in it, not even what she would later call a bed. She said 2,000 people were in one room with literally nothing, all starving, all shaved, and all humiliated. She said the women who had just had their children stripped away from them were literally going crazy to the point that the SS would just shoot them and kill them. She said she very, learned very quickly how to behave in Auschwitz. Eventually, she was moved to a barrack that had beds. And by beds, we mean, I mean a wooden shelf with slats, no pillow, no blankets, I mean, no, no pillow and blankets made of God knows what. Um, I actually visited Auschwitz when I was on the March of the Living, and this is a picture that I took of beds that we saw in one of the barracks there. Anya talked a lot about the daily roll call, the lineup, the count. It had many names. She said, no matter what the weather was, in the middle of the night, they were forced to stand outside, wasting away, while they were counted. When prisoners were missing, the count lasted longer. She said she would wake up each day and find dead bodies all around. That she would walk outside and there would be even more dead bodies. I wanted to share these two pictures with you while I tell you a few of the stories that Anu shared with my eighth grade class. The picture on the left is her wedding picture to my grandfather, Joseph, and the picture on the right is how I think of her before she got sick and passed away. Anu talked about how the SS guards would push and shove and whip the prisoners for no reason, and that one time she was whipped so hard she couldn't sit for two weeks. She also told a story of how she was so hungry that she and another girl went, on, went to search through some garbage to look for food and were caught. The SS guard shot the girl that was standing next to her through the heart, and she died next to my Anu, who somehow managed to run back to the barrack and survived. She also talked about how there were days when they would come out of the barracks and they would see the smoke billowing out of the crematorium, and then they'd realize that an entire barrack did not show up for the count. She said that she felt that God must have looked away or abandoned them to have allowed this to happen. And it's hard to believe that she was able to find her faith after what happened, but she did. And one day, whether it was lack of nourishment or perhaps an act of God during roll call, it was a rainy night, late night, early morning, and the prisoners were forced to kneel because somebody was missing from the count. And while they were kneeling, and while the ground was all muddy, my grandmother ended up having a miscarriage. The rain and the muddy grounds and the women that were surrounding her that helped her cover up the blood saved her life. She likely escaped death or worse once again. And as a point of how being a prisoner during the war was just such a terrible, played terrible with their minds. My grandmother said to my class that she was lucky to have had this miscarriage because she knows that lying about her pregnancy and being caught very likely could have resulted in her death. She also talked about how since the men and women were separated at Auschwitz, 
they would throw pieces of wood over the fence in, with names of their loved ones to see if anybody knew their whereabouts. And my grandmother said that one day she found a piece of wood with her name on it and it gave her hope to know that my grandfather was on the other side and still alive. As the US and Russian armies drew near, Nazis started to kill the Jews more quickly. As my grandmother said, they were trying to hide the evidence. She said the gas chambers were going nonstop, that there were shootings in the little courtyards in between the barracks at all hours of the day and night. And sometime at the end of 1944 or early 1995, before Auschwitz was liberated, Anu and her sister Irene were sent to work in a factory to help with the German war effort. She said she was there for a few months and remembers hearing bombings all around them and that each time they heard a bomb, they prayed that the war was coming to an end. We know that the gas chambers could only hold so many and that the Nazis resorted to what became known as death marches. One of the marches was from Auschwitz to Birkenau and others were from Auschwitz to other camps. From the factory, which we believe was somewhere near Auschwitz, Anu, Irene, and other prisoners were forced to walk from Auschwitz to Theresien. It's approximately a 261 mile walk. She said it took them three weeks. Theresien um, was a different kind of camp, but most of the people who arrived there were never came, never, did not make it out alive. Anu said that during their walk, they barely had any food unless they were able to steal some from the side of the road. And while on this death march, her sister Irene, who had been sick in the camps earlier on, became even sicker. Anu would literally carry her on her back at times and pinch her cheeks so that she looked healthier in order to keep her from being left for dead. They arrived in Theresien, and that's from where they were liberated on May 9, 1945. Just to put the march into perspective, if you were to, if you were to walk from Parsippany, New Jersey to Washington, DC, you would not walk as far as Anu and Irene were forced to walk while they were starving and emaciated during what was likely very cold months in Europe. After liberation, Anu and Irene made their way back to Batiz. They found out that three of their brothers survived. So of the 11 children in their family, only five survived. Six nieces and nephews also survived, but full lines of their family died. When Anu spoke to my eighth grade class, she had said that all she hoped for when she came out of the camps and returned home was to kiss her father one more time, but her father didn't make it. Shortly after my grandmother was returned to Batis, my grandfather returned as well. We don't know much about his story, but we believe that he spent time in Dachau and Auschwitz. He was liberated by the Americans and they wanted to send him to bring him to America right away, but he refused to go until he could find out whether or not my grandmother was still alive. He returned to Batis and my, he wanted to leave for America, but my grandmother refused to leave her family. My grandfather was the sole survivor from his immediate family. My grandparents ended up taking in one of my grandmother's nephews, Alan, and he, um, he became like an older brother to my aunt and my mom. My aunt was born less than a year after my grandparents reunited. And my mom was born six years later in 1952. This is a picture of my family still in Romania with my grandmother on the left, my grandfather seated in the chair, my mom on his lap. Next to Anu is Alan and his arm is around my Aunt Marie. The other two women are nieces of my grandmother who had lost their parents in the war. Alan became a very important figure in my life, and when he passed away in 2016, his death really hit me because he was the last living survivor from my family. That's when I took steps to put together my grandmother's story, to start putting together my grandmother's story 
and become more involved in Holocaust education. The only video we have of my grandmother telling her story is the one that my dad took on a giant VHS camcorder when she spoke to my eighth grade class. Unfortunately, she passed away before the Shoah Foundation started to conduct survivor interviews. When the war ended, it wasn't as though people started to have compassion for the Jews. Anu said that anti-Semitism was still widespread, but in Sachimare, life was okay. Eventually, two of my grandmother's brothers left and went to Australia. The other brother, Irene, and the children of the sister, uh, and the other children that had survived who had lost their parents went to Israel. In 1961, my grandparents, my aunt, my mom, and Alan left Romania. They left with nothing and they were heading to Israel, but stopped in Paris on the way because my grandparents had always wanted to see it. And while there, my grandfather reached out to one of his cousins in America who had survived and he convinced them to come to America. My grandparents settled in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. And this is a picture of them in front of the house that they ultimately bought. My grandfather worked as a mechanic and Anu worked in a coat factory. They made a life for themselves. And unfortunately, my grandfather passed away nine years after they immigrated when my mom was only 19. Anu passed away in 1994 of cancer an unimaginable horror after having already suffered so much. I wish I knew more because it's just so unbelievable to think what they survived. I knew she was an amazing woman, but she is truly remarkable to have survived what she did. And despite the Nazi efforts, our family has grown. The Nazis tried to kill all Jews, but of the Moldovan family, we had a 2000, we had a reunion in 2014 where over 60 of us gathered from around the world in Israel. Not everyone could make it, but in this picture we have Alan, who seated five people in from the left um, on the chairs, who was the oldest person in the picture and the only living survivor from my family in addition to his wife, Lily, and the youngest, my niece, my sister's daughter in the front, who's a baby, and she was four months old because we booked the trip not knowing my sister was pregnant. So despite the Nazi efforts, our family has grown tremendously to show our resilience. And I speak to you today and to other, and the reason I give these talks is because we can't let hate win. We all have to be upstanders, not bystanders. We have to do what we can to end the hate, no matter what the climate is out there. So thank you for listening, Shana Tova, and David and Jessica, I turn it back to you. Thank you. Elise, um, thank you so much for gifting us with your family story. We're now going to open it up for questions. If you have a question for Elise, please type it into the Q&A and we will do our best to get to it. We'll prioritize questions directed at Elise and her story, and if there are any 3G NY, 3G NJ, or we do specific questions, we'll try to get to those, but if we cannot, please email them to info at 3GNewYork.org, and we will respond there. Um, Jessica, you wanna start with the first question? Sure, so uh, Elise, again, uh, your story is, your grandmother's story is amazing, and. Uh, you know, you did an amazing job telling it. So thank you on behalf of all of us. Um, and so question we got here today, uh, the uh, person has written on the New Jersey Holocaust Commission, how do they ensure that the schools make this an important part of the curriculum? So new, since 1994, New Jersey has had a state mandate that Holocaust and genocide education be taught at all levels, K through 12. So it doesn't necessarily mean teaching the Holocaust. It means teaching acceptance, anti-bullying, and the, the commission has a curriculum that is currently being updated um, with the help of a number of educators throughout the state. And the commission also sponsors a, an annual, not when, when we're not in a pandemic, trip um, that brings, which is uh, partially funded by NJEA, 
and they bring educators to the infamous sites of the Holocaust throughout Europe. And the commission also has a speakers bureau um, on which I am now listed and also um, provides training throughout the year and different opportunities for teachers to continue to grow and learn themselves and be able to teach the Holocaust in different ways to children. Um, you know, it gets harder and harder to teach it when you don't have survivors to tell their stories. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so grateful for the We Do program, because it allows me to have the confidence and the ability to go into the schools and um, fill the void that's being left by the survivors as they get too old or past. So uh, I just want to remind people to please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom to you know, post your questions. Uh, this one did come through the chat. It says, your family comes from an area that the famous Hasidic sect comes from. Are or were any of your family involved with the Satmar Hasidim? So, um, I, I know that the Sajumari rabbi was, you know, one very well known. I don't believe that there's any connection. Um, and I really, unfortunately, don't know how to find that out. But I, I, I've asked, I've talked to my mom and my aunt about that. And I don't, we don't think that there is a connection. Okay. Great. Um, so Elise, your mom says she loves you. She's on here and <laughs> chatted that. <laughs> so, uh, so that's awesome. We also had somebody else uh, chat in the Q&A that she was very thankful for sharing your story. Um, again, if you'd like to use the Q&A to uh, ask a question, please do. But I have one, Elise, um, and this has uh, resonated with me uh, through the time that I've known you and we've been sharing our grandparents' stories that your grandmother often said and told you that she was one of the lucky ones. And if you listen to her story, on the face of it, it does not seem like she was very lucky at all. And I think this is a time, and uh, our co-founder, uh, Michelle Edgar, has actually uh, done a couple of programs on this, but I think this is a time when people are looking for ways to be resilient. So do you think that that idea of her feeling lucky in these circumstances that would seem unlucky helped her be resilient? Does it help you be resilient, your family? You know, how, did, how does that uh, concept of lucky kind of fit in? I, I think it's a strange concept. And every time she said that to my class in eighth grade, when I watched the video now, I was like, what do you mean? You know, I wish I could say to her, what do you mean you were lucky? Like you weren't lucky, you, you were literally tortured. Um, but I think the fact that she had faith um, in her Judaism, and one of the things that struck me when she told her story was that somehow, even though I can't keep track of the days in my regular life, she talked about the events that happened to her based on Shabbat and the Jewish holidays. So I think that her faith had a lot to do with her luck, and I think that for me now, um, I think about the fact that if she could find silver linings, then no matter what I endure, I should be able to find a silver lining as well. All right, here's another one. Um, <clears throat> what happened between liberation and leaving in 61? Why did, why did they stay so long? So that's actually um, a story within a story. Um, my after my aunt was born, my grandparents and Alan and my aunt, who was a baby at the time, did try to leave, um, but they got caught at the border. So even though my grandparents had been liberated from the camps, they found themselves once again imprisoned. Um, I believe my grandfather was imprisoned for a year. I think Alan was imprisoned for a year, my grandmother for six months, and my aunt was sent to live with one of my grandmother's siblings who took care of her. So after they returned once again to Batiz after that um, imprisonment, they decided to wait and go through all of the proper channels rather than escape. And it took that long that my mother was then born in 1952. Um, and they didn't leave until approximately 1961. And then they spent 
10 months in Paris before they came to the US because once they made the decision to go to the United States rather than Israel, they had to spend a certain amount of time and go through certain tests before they were allowed to immigrate. Thank you. Um, so we have a question here. Can you talk a little bit about your research process? Besides the video, what avenues did you use to find out information like documents, personal family research, et cetera? Great so it was a lot of personal family research. Um, you know, my aunt was born nine months after my grandparents reunited. So she um, and my mom both having lived in Romania saw their cousins and their aunts and their uncles and they all grew up together. So there was a lot of family history there. And um, we, we have some documentation from my grandfather and that's how we know that he was in Dachau. Um, but the rest of it really is for my grandmother's story, the time that she spoke to my class, talking with my mom and my aunt as to what they remember hearing from her. And then, you know, the different facts about the number of prisoners and the types of camps that they were in as research that I did on my own. What are the typical questions that students have asked you? Um, so I actually haven't had the opportunity to do too many student talks because of COVID and the way that the timing worked. But, you know, it really depends on the audience. And I sometimes do the questions for them before they get to, would get to ask. So depending upon what I know the students have learned, I, could, I would ask, you know, have you heard of Auschwitz? Or do you know what a ghetto is? And have you heard of Dr. Mengele? So I try to do some of the questioning uh, as a way to engage them. But most people seem interested in just you know, hearing my grandmother's name, knowing her story, and, um, you know, helping me with wanting to make sure that she, she and her struggles are never forgotten. Thank you. And then we have two questions that actually ask uh, the same thing, which is, have you been to where your grandparents lived in Romania, or have any plans to go there? Um, and, you know, maybe if you could talk a little bit, I know you have been to Europe to, uh, you mentioned in the presentation Auschwitz, so can you talk a little bit about going back to Europe? Sure. Um, so I have not been to Satumare, to Batis, but my mom went, I don't remember how many years ago, but a number of years ago, and she said it's, it's just totally different. The house that my mother grew up in, I think, is a bank now. Um, she said it's just, it's, it does, it's not the farm country that it was back then. So I actually, I don't have any desire to go there. Um, and the, I, when I was on the March of the Living, I participated in it in 1996 and we visited Warsaw, we visited Krakow, we visited a number of ghettos, we went to a number of camps. Uh, that I, I was struck by that and I had a lot of emotions while I was there because I often, knowing how big my family was, um, you know, my grandfather being one of five children and the only one that, and the only survivor, and my grandmother being uh, the 10th of 11 children with so many nieces and nephews, I, all I kept thinking while I was there, and I actually went back and read my journal recently, is that I could be stepping on ground that my family was killed on. And um, it was powerful. And I really would actually like to go back again as an adult, but clearly that's not happening anytime soon with the restrictions on visiting the EU at the moment. But, and I also ha I have two kids. Um, my older daughter is nine and my younger one is five. And I think it's important for them to go as well. So I hope to one day bring them. Um. That's actually a good question. It leads to another question. Have other members of your family been interested in Holocaust education or have you taken on that role for like your generation? So most of my family is in Israel and um, I think they see things differently there. I think, I think they have a little bit of a different perspective. They're all interested and we all have this incredible tie to each other. And I think a lot of it has to do with how close 
our parents, the two G's were to each other, having grown up and been born in Romania, and how close their parents were because of the war and only five of them surviving. So I've spoken to my cousins there and everybody is very tied to it. Um, my sister is here, of course, in America with me and I think on this program as well. And um, she is a big supporter of 3G and J and the work that we're doing. Um, but as far as education goes, serving on the commission and putting the story together to present to students to keep her story alive, I have um, taken that on. And then Alan's daughter, so Alan and his wife both passed away, um, but his daughter, who is a 2G, she also um, feels very emotionally tied to the Holocaust as well. And at, at least thankfully, Alan was interviewed and did speak publicly before he passed away. So Elise, I know there's so much that you could have put in a presentation. Um, and one of them is possibly uh, more about your grandmother, sister and their relationship. Um, so specifically this question asks, did your grandmother or sister survive the one she brought to Theresen? And if yes, did they stay close? So my grandmother's sister, Irene, who we called Edenania for anti, I think it means Aunt Irene, um, did survive and recovered and lived a long, healthy life. I only, she went to Israel after the family started leaving Romania. And I think it was one of the big reasons my grandmother wanted to go to Israel was to be with her family. But ultimately, she and my grandfather made the decision to come to America um, Irene, I was actually able to see her when I was in Israel after the March of the Living. Um, and so that was 1996 and she passed away shortly after that. So she has a wonderful family who we're very close with and they all live in Israel. Oh, but, and just to tie one thing in, my grandmother stayed extremely close with her. And actually one of my cousins, you said to me recently that my grandmother was Facebook before there was Facebook because she would take pictures of my sister and me with her to Israel because she tried to go as often as she could um, to see the family there and then bring pictures back with, of all of them to us. So she was Facebook before there was Facebook. And unfortunately, she never made it to Australia because um, while she was on her way to Australia from New Jersey, and then she had a layover in California, her, um, that's when my grandfather passed away and they had to call her and tell her to turn around and come home. So she actually never made it to Australia. What, what is the main way your grandmother's experience influenced your life? <sighs> Um, <laughs> that's, a <tough> one. <laughs> that's a really tough one as three G's on this call. I think we can all agree. That's a tough one. You know, with regret, I have to say, I don't think it impacted my life early enough when she was here. And it wasn't until I was an adult, um, more educated, married, having my own family and really understanding the world that I was able to see the strength that she had that, you know, I don't know that I could have survived what she survived. And I think it gives me this inner strength to know that that's who I come from. And then the other piece of it also is I always think like the butterfly effect, one little thing for my grandmother or my grandfather one little change and I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be who I am. So uh, David, I think we're going to do one more before we wrap. And what I'll do is combine two questions that I see here into uh, one question. I think that'll work for our wrap up. So the questions kind of center around uh, modern day hatred and anti-Semitism on campuses um, and whether or not you feel that there will always be hatred and discrimination. And what do you think that it will take to reverse 
the momentum of hatred and violent acts? Well, I think that's um, a very big question <laughs> with a lot of answers. Um, but for me, it always comes back to education. And I think about the pyramid of hate where you have you know, just some nasty comments and jokes at the bottom of the pyramid. And, you know, then it comes to violence and ultimately it comes to genocide. And if we don't, if we're not all upstanders and we're not all speaking out against the hate, it can lead to a genocide. And I also think that with education, people learn that we, we need to accept people for who they are. We can't, you know, it doesn't matter what color their skin is, what God they believe in. We all have the right to be human and we all have the right to feel safe. So seeing anti-Semitic acts on a regular basis these days, seeing, you know, violence towards black people, we have to do what we can to educate people so that they understand other cultures to try to end the hate. Leith and Jessica, thank you for joining us and for being partners and friends to 3GNY. Elise, thanks for sharing your powerful story. And thanks again to all of you viewers, wherever you may be located for being here. We're glad you took the time to hear Elise's family story, an important story that must never be forgotten. If you haven't yet made a gift to support our educational programs, we hope you'll consider making one now. Please refer to the chat box again for a link to donate. Thank you. If you know educators who may want our speakers to present to their classes, please be in touch with us. We are always looking for more classes and opportunities for our speakers. We hope to see you again soon. We have some great virtual events coming up, including We Do Wednesdays every two weeks. Our next one on Wednesday, September 30th, will feature Ariel Delman, whose grandmother was saved by Oscar Schindler. And on October 14th, Emily Greenspan will be sharing her story. And on October 28th, we'll hear from Elizabeth Kamins. We'll be sending out an email tomorrow with details and registration links for these events, as well as a recording of tonight's program. I encourage you to check out our past We Do Speakers on 3GNY's YouTube channel. Please share these stories with friends and family to help keep them alive. Thanks so much again for taking the time out of your evening to be with us. Have a great night. Shana Tova. We hope you have a happy and healthy new year. Have a good night.